welcome to the Business Credit and Financing Show. Each week, we talk about the growth strategies that matter most to entrepreneurs. Listen in as we discuss the secrets to getting credit and money to start and grow your business. And enjoy as we talk with seasoned business owners, coaches, and industry leaders on a variety of topics from advertising and marketing to the nuts and bolts of running a highly successful business. And now, to introduce the host of our show, financial expert and award-winning author, Ty Crandall. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show today. So I'm really excited today to have a really cool guest with us because, you know, I think leadership and and building a high-performance team is, well, I don't think, I know it's absolutely essential to every organization, but there's so many people out there that just don't know how to lead. This isn't a topic that we're taught in any form of schooling from what I've experienced. So I wanted to bring on somebody today that's really the foremost expert in this area uh, to talk a little bit more. So let me tell you a little bit more about Jeffrey Davidson. So by the age of 35, Jeffrey had actually been both the director at a startup and president of a multi-million dollar sales organization. And despite his reading, teaching, and different roles he had filled, he didn't consider himself to be a good leader. None of his teams came close to reaching their potential. And due to his frustration, he actually gave up on management and became a consultant. Now, real leadership for him began when a client asked him to build a team of analysts, and he started by hiring good people and keeping an unrelenting focus on learning and improvement. Within two years, the team was the envy of that organization, and eventually, Jeffrey realized he hadn't taught people how to be good team. The team had taught him how to lead. So Jeffrey took his hard-won knowledge and went back into consulting, rescuing high-impact projects, and at every instance, there were at least two problems, and one of them was always teamwork. So you've probably noticed that the world's more connected, complex, chaotic, and faster than ever, and it feels like these forces are trying to rip apart your business. Well, Jeffrey's here to speak about the need for responsive leaders and adaptive teams. More, he's going to lay out the steps it takes for leaders to get teams from mediocre to high performance. So, uh, Jeffrey, thanks for joining us today. Wow. Hi, thanks for having me. I want you to know... At one point, I was laughing at something you said, you know, when you're talking about how we're educated or not educated about being leaders. At another point, I almost cried because I was remembering that team that taught me how to be a leader. Um, And those people just touched my heart. Well, it's so true, though. You know, I mean, as important as, as leadership is to an organization, I, I don't know of any college or high school courses or anything where they really teach and touch upon uh, being a great leader. Well, it's it's a hard thing to master. And academia, you know, they're good at studying a lot of stuff, but it's often more esoteric or, you know, banal. It's totally common. Um, but that leadership is it's part art, part science. And how do we get that mix? So I don't know. Maybe it's because you and I haven't gone into academia that uh, colleges don't teach this yet. <laughs> it's very true. It's very well. You know, it's interesting because I'm right now in the beginning portions of a book called Multipliers. Have you ever heard or read that from Liz Wiseman? You know, I've seen the title, but my list of books is so. Long. <laughs> well, it's an interesting one because, and I'm glad you're on to talk about the same timing because I'm into this because it really it talks about you know these couple different kind of leaders, which I'm sure you probably have more layers, and how you know there's people that empower them and bring out the best to their team, and there's the ones that just kind of want all the credit and you know if anything hold their people down, and it's really an interesting look into this area. But how did you get started? I mean, what really got you interested into leadership itself? You know, that's a great question. I had this interest at some level for a long time. I think part of it is, is I like control. And you have more control if you're a leader. And so many people actually fall into that. Uh, I recently read a study that's fascinating on that level, which is that um, many people in their career want to get ahead. And they want more control over their destiny. And the only way to get more control over your own destiny is to go into management. The problem is those people don't necessarily want to help others. They just want more freedom to control their own destiny. Sure. They become a manager over other people in order to have control of their own destiny. And along the way, they get assigned a bunch of people to help too. And they're like, well, I didn't know what to do with those people. (laughs) We Like we just talked about, we don't have good training. We don't have good resources. Now, I don't want to say the whole world doesn't have it. You know, the military has some great resources. They built some outstanding leadership. 
But most of society doesn't go through a military academy. Right. Well, now you referenced something and, you know, going from, I think it's me to amazing, right? M-E-H. What do you mean by that? I pronounce it as meh. Meh. Eh, meh, which for me is uh, blah. Because most teams are meh. They're just disengaged. They're not even a team. There are a bunch of people in the same room for a once a week meeting that we call a team, but they're not working together. And oh, the wasted potential. It, it's just, it drives me crazy. So I want to take people from this totally blah, this meh, this, you know, you want to spit it out of your mouth kind of team because it's not really a team. It's just a bunch of people who hang out together, you know, because they're forced to, to some people who are working together, who are figuring out what to do, who are getting stuff done, who are executing. And I was like, whoa, have you seen that group? Holy cow, you give them something and it happens. Doesn't everybody want that? I mean, which would you rather be on? Would you rather just hang out with some people, you know, that are looking at their phone and ignoring you and don't answer your emails or won't return your call? Or when you ask a question, they're like, I don't know, I'm going to go talk to somebody else. Or do you want to work with a group of people who are just totally digging in and making a difference? Oh, my gosh, it's such a huge difference between the two. Yeah, I mean, definitely. What are the steps that you've seen? I mean, you so you're really good at mapping out these steps. So how do you get from this meh, you know, to an amazing team? Thanks for asking. Um, the first thing is uh, the team needs to know what their meaning is. And by meaning, it's um, how are we trying to make a difference out there? You know, and it doesn't have to be a huge thing. Sometimes, let's say you've got a small painting company and you're painting apartments or homes. You know, we just want people to come in and to feel cheery when they look at our walls. You know, that's that's giving meaning to someone's life. Um, you know, if, I don't remember what Uber's meaning is off the top of my head, but you know, we want to help people get safely from one place to another. You know, without the hassle of a car, or driving drunk, or whatever it is. So those are really how are we trying to make a difference for some customer's life. We have to explain the meaning. That's the first thing. Um, and the second is. Um, and too many people just don't know what the meaning of their team is, don't know the meaning of their work, don't know the meaning of their organization. Um, at, at some level, we have to know where that meaning is. But the next thing that we really need to have is we need to know what success looks like. In other words, are you successful if you paint the wall, or are you successful in how you talk to the customer um, and wear booties on your shoes so you don't track paint across the carpet, or, 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 or. You know, we need to have a conversation about what does a happy customer look like? What problem are we solving and what does success look like? If we never talk about what success looks like, you know, if I just throw something up there, it's good enough. But too often, almost always, that isn't good enough. So those are the first two things for me is where do we have meaning and what is success like? So it really starts with, you know, developing a mission statement, a core purpose, and the team to understand whether the company or especially the team, what that core purpose is, what the goal is, where you're going to, right? I mean, you can't, you know, pilot anything if you don't have a destination um, successfully. So, and then the second aspect, it sounds like, is knowing what if you succeed, what that looks like, right? I mean, knowing basically the expectations so you know how to meet and even exceed those expectations that are set upon you. Wow. Like, I can't, I'm so glad this is a podcast because I'm just going to write down the stuff you said. <laughs> So I, I really agree. And one thing I want to talk about success is I'm a big believer that, you know, checklists can help us do the right job. But a lot of times, and I work with really big companies sometimes, and they have a checklist of all the things they want this project to do. And I've seen checklists that are 60 to 300 items long. And they're told success is when you do all 300 items. But we need to talk about what kind of impact we're making. Because if you can make an impact in doing 80 items, the last 220 on your list of 300 are a waste. Don't do it. Because once you hit your impact, you've hit your goal. That's really important to know what your goal is. Other times is you do 80 and you're like, do you know what? If we continue down this path, it doesn't make a difference if we do 220 more. We're going to be going in the wrong direction. So. 
how do we figure that out? We've got to pay attention to these things and really say, what kind of impact are we making? Because all of our to-do items are really just our guesses about how to get there. So right. let's be clear about what we're doing. Let's be clear about our guesses. And let's realize it's okay to make a mistake. We are all human. Yeah, absolutely. And and I love that. And that's one of the things that we learn in the military too, right? Is that, you know, it's not a matter of just telling you what you need to do. You have to understand what the mission is. If you understand what the mission is, then if you're not able to fulfill the task you have, you can find alternatives to still accomplish the mission. And that's exactly what you're sound, is saying is the same thing. You know the mission is, you know the expectations, you know the rules of the game, then that's really the key to success. <laughs> You're so right. You know, there's a great modern philosopher I like to quote. Um, you might have heard of him before. His name is Mike Tyson. <laughs> I love Mike Tyson. He's definitely a philosopher, yes. Yeah. Well, one of his one of his <laughs> statements is, um, every man has a plan until you punch him in the mouth. And planning is important, but we've got to know that when we try to implement our plan, reality is going to punch that plan right in the mouth. Right. So the important part isn't the plan. The important part is the planning, is figuring out what we think we're going to need to do. How are we? What's the goal? And what are our different ways to get there? Where do we have a risk? Where do we have an easy path? Where do we have some? I don't know if this going to work, but it's a moonshot. Let's take it. The planning is so important. Your plan, go ahead, build one, but it's not going to last. Right. Well, so the team, you know, they understand where they're headed. They understand the rules of the game per se. But, you know, you're you're talking about a team which usually consists of a lot of different types of people, a lot of different types of personalities. So what do you think the key is to getting a team to work cohesively together towards that common goal? Great question, but I'm going to back up just a second. I want to say that sometimes I've seen teams built where everyone is the same personality type. Like everyone hired the same kind of person. And just so you know, if you've got that kind of team, you're in for a problem because you don't have enough diversity. You know, diversity is great whether we're talking gender or race or religion or, you know, country of origin or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it doesn't, you can even have some differences there. But if everyone is a really social supportive person, but you don't have any people who are really inquisitive or someone who's really a driver or if you don't have someone who's really, you know, energetic and interactive your team can kind of implode on itself. So, first is, we need different people. You will do better with those. But then let's get to your question, which is, how do we get those people to interact to each other, to really become a bonded unit, and to achieve success? And for me, there's a couple elements. But one of those elements is, you have to get to know each other. In other words, some people like to get up and work early, some people like to work late. Some people want just the outline. Some people want all the details. Some people like to be interrupted. Some people want you to schedule a meeting. You've got to actually talk about some of these differences so that you can figure out how each other likes to work. Because if I'm the kind of person who wants you to schedule a meeting and Ty, you're an interrupter, well, you're going to interrupt me and I'm going to be annoyed. I'm going to schedule a meeting and you're going to think, geez, why did you waste time even scheduling? Just come over and talk to me. So we need to both share who we are and appreciate that other people are not always like us. So that's the first step. Um, and it really leads directly to the second, which is as a group, we need to come up with our own norms. Uh, sometimes these are called working agreements or standards of conduct, which is how are we going to treat each other as a team? How do we... Um, want to handle conflict. Um, how, what are we going to do when we have meetings? Um, how are we going to interact? How are we going to support each other? Those things very key. If you don't have a way to work together, then you're going to struggle. Well, how important? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Your question. In doing that, I mean, so how important is it all sitting down and understanding your team in a work environment? Or do you recommend that, you know, teams get together outside of the workplace to kind of get a feel for who they really are? I mean, how do you really get to that kind of information? Great question. I, I think all teams should spend a little bit of time on the social, on the non-work. Uh, but let's be realistic. In today's society, sometimes we have distributed teams where you're in different parts of the city or the state or the country or even the globe. 
so that's not always possible. Um, and the other is, you know, as people get older, they've got families and obligations, so it's sometimes harder. Uh, so I love for teams to at least occasionally take the time to just be social. That being said, you can do this just during working hours, but you've got to pay attention to it. If you're not, maybe bring in a facilitator, you know, have a leader or someone from a different team come and say, let me lead you through some questions just to figure out how to get to each other. I, I, you're going to have it in your show notes, but I've got a free resource, just a PDF, that helps people ask some of these questions that says, you know, what do I like versus what do you like to kind of give you the insight into let's talk about how we're the same and how we're different so we can get better. I just want to help people figure out how to work together because when we're working together, we can solve problems that we can't do alone. Now, where can they get that free resource? And we will talk about that as we wrap up as well. So on my website, uh, greatteamsltd.com slash more. Okay. More, it's, it just has a two, three, four PDFs there that you can download to help your team learn more about each other and get along better. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and I, and I, we will talk about that as we uh, as we wrap up as well. So we've talked about you know managing and started to talk about the managing of a team. But if we take a step back, you know, we talk about these personalities, and you know, it, it's natural for somebody to want to hire people like them in a lot of cases. But what's the key to build a team of diverse diversity where you've got all these unique people with unique skill sets that can really make the team succeed? Another outstanding question. Superb. So, you're right. Hiring people is is a challenge. I believe that there's a few people that you can hire. Ten percent or less of the population. There's a similar group. Ten percent or less. So hard, no matter what. So it really comes down to defining the culture. And then hiring based on the culture, not even, I mean, above and beyond even the skill set. You know, desire, but no matter what I desire, it's going to change. My plan is going to get hit in the mouth with reality. So I've got to have good people who are ready for the ride. Now, what are some things that you've found that can kind of enhance the performance of the individuals on the team? So this sounds basic, but... For me, this is key. And that is expectations. So what about enhancing the overall team performance? You know, if we do that with the individuals, are there things that you can do to, you know, outside of that to, you know, the entire organization itself, the entire team, to enhance the entire team's performance? What about leadership style and all this? I mean, how much does the style of the leader really affect the results of the individuals and team itself, you think? I would love to see. <laughs> the truth is that it's not about the leadership style because I've seen people who are just sweethearts and almost pushovers be incredibly effective. And I've seen people who are jerks be incredibly effective. It's not really for me about the style. That's a good way to look at it. What about, you mentioned teams, get-togethers, these things. How often do you think teams should get together? Well, Daily. If you're doing work on a daily basis, you should be telling people how you're doing on a daily basis. It's part of accountability. I think that good accounting board sometimes is enough to get me over my hump. What about motivating? What, what do you think some of the things a good leader should, a good leader should do to actually motivate a team? <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting here in my chair just laughing time. <laughs> because I would like to think I can motivate anyone to anything. But the truth is, it's all in their own head. All I can do is give them the chance some of the time, because we're all individuals. But usually, we're often. So when they do that, you know, what's the best way to get feedback from the team? I mean, you set up feedback loops. I mean, what's the best way to get honest feedback, uh, which I imagine would be pretty important for building a successful high-performance team? I think it's two things. Asking for feedback and listening. I've got, a, I've got a client right now, and he asks for feedback. And then when people start to get feedback, they can do to ask to get feedback. I think that when a leader gets to know their team, they say, hey, I'm trying to do a good job. 
I, the leader, am trying to do a good job with you. So how do we make sure that that works? We just need to be saying, I'm trying. I'm not perfect either. So on a regular basis, I'm going to ask you, um, what can I build upon? I did something right. How can I build and make it better? And where should I refocus? Which is, I tried, but it didn't quite work. As a leader of a team, I often do this with my team members when I'm leaving a meeting. So if I have any kind of part in leading that meeting or discussing it, as I'm leaving the meeting with my teammates, I'll walk out and I'll say, hey, we were just in this meeting together. Now we're walking through the hallways of the business. What do you think went well? What could I build upon and make even better? And the team will answer those questions. And then I'll say, okay, where should I refocus? Because I know the whole thing wasn't perfect. Uh, what do you think? And then they give me their answer. And then I'll say, when I critique my own performance, here's what I see. Here's the good stuff or the bad stuff that I think was going on in that meeting. And when I do that, just in a casual leave the meeting basis with my team, they learn I'm always open for that conversation, for that dialogue about how to get better. And after I've done that to them two or three times, I'll say, okay, now it's your turn. Ask me. And they'll say, ask what, boss? I'll say, ask me where you should refocus. And they're like, you want me to ask you for feedback? I'm like, no, no, I didn't say feedback. I said, ask me where you should refocus. Ask me where you can build upon. And here's a subtle thing I'm doing when I want them to ask these questions, is that if I just volunteer the information, our brain shut down and doesn't take new information. It's much harder. But if I have them ask me for that input, the brain does some subtle shifts. And uh, there's more research from the Neuro Leadership Institute and Dr. Heidi Graham, but we don't care about the research. All we like care about is the effect. And that is by asking, I get some subtle shifts where I'm more receptive for it. So I literally tell my people, ask these questions. Then they repeat the question word for word, and then I tell them. <laughs> I'm happy to use brain science for my advantage and for the team. <laughs> well, um, so when you're, when you're doing this and you're, you're coming in and being a leader like this, I mean, what are some other, because you've given some great tips. I mean, what are some other awesome tips that can help somebody become a leader that's a great leader, you know, somebody that, that people want to follow? You, you know, that's a really key question. And people often say, how do I make my people want to follow me? And I think they just need to twist the question around, which is, who would I want to follow? And what do I need to do to be someone I would follow? You see that subtle shift? Yeah, right. Okay. I, I want to spinboard up or springboard off of that to something else, which is everyone I know, everyone I know, when they wake up and they're getting ready in the morning and they're looking in the mirror, they think, I want to do a good job today. I don't know anyone who says, I can't wait to go in and be a jerk. No one says that. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so since everyone is saying, I want to go in and do a good job today, I think we need to be able to realize that if I'm thinking that, my people are thinking that. And since they want to do a good job, if they're not, how do I both acknowledge their desire and acknowledge where they missed the mark? That's not a bad thing. That's our job as a leader is to say, hey, you've got great intent. Let me help you deliver great stuff. I think if we come in with that attitude and remember that we're, no matter who you are as a leader, no matter where you are in the organization, there's still someone you're following. You could be the CEO of a Fortune 50 company. You're still answering to a board of directors. So you're still following someone. So now we need to figure out, hmm, how do I be the kind of leader I want to follow? What about the actual individual team members themselves? I mean, we've talked kind of about how people have their own individual strengths and how to bring them together as a cohesive unit. Well, how do you best recognize the natural talents of a team member and then maximize those abilities for the best interest of the team? That's a really good question. And I think this gets back to, I talked about uh, Daniel Pink and Drive. Part of this is that autonomy the ability to organize your own work, is that as a leader, I really want to say, 
here's the objective and here's what success looks like. We talked about the military and their training. You know, if you tell the army, hey, we need to get to the top of that hill, and then you let them figure out how to get there, I think the same is true for your team. We need to be specific about the objective we want and how we get there. We need to say to the team, what do you think the best way to get there is? And get their input. And the team itself will recognize who their own stars are. The team will also recognize who the people who act like rock stars but are really jerks. And the team will recognize who's underperforming. And when you start to get those good team dynamics going, they'll do some of that coaching on their own and help people get into this culture we talked about, execution. And if not, you can get some feedback loops in there and say, okay, here's where I need to intervene as a leader. But I think much of it is just the chance for people to do good work. Just give them the chance, and that's often enough. Well, what about empowering a team? I mean, what kind of things do you do as a leader to empower the team where they can make their own decision? Say that you're empowered, and that's all they do. They just say you're empowered. But for me, empowerment is saying, um, here's our meaning. Here's clarity around where we're going. Now let's have a discussion. What do you think the best way to get there is? And then listening. Letting the team say, I think the best way to get there is if we try this. And as a leader, you can say, do you know what? Let's do a small experiment. If it looks like we're on the right track after two days or two weeks, we'll do more. If not, come back with another idea. That's empowerment. That's telling people, based on this goal, to hit this kind of meeting and make a difference in the world, where do you think the best is? That's the empowerment I think that we need to be giving our teams. I love it. So that being said, I mean, what do you think? In the end, you've worked with a bunch of teams. You've worked with some big companies. What are some of the characteristics? I mean, how can you spot a high-performance team? Oh, a high-performance team laughs more than other people. A high-performance team, over the course of a week or two, all the people contribute. And relatively equally. And that's important to notice because, you know, when you've got a group of, let's say, seven people, some of them are going to be talking more uh, just naturally. Some people are talkers. And some people are quiet and thinkers and processors. So I'm not worried about one meeting. But over the course of the week, do your talkers be quiet often enough to hear other people? And do you provide a safe space for your people who are usually quiet to give input? So they laugh, they give input, and they're constantly saying, uh, you know, I don't think that worked. Let's try something different. And sometimes it's about huge things, and sometimes it's about minor things. But just a regular, eh, let's fix something. If I've got those three things, I'm pretty sure they're high performing. Oh, and of course they're delivering the goods. Right, absolutely. That's what's most important. So, any final thoughts here? You've, you've been amazing. I mean, we've talked about a lot of different things from empowering the team to looking at individuals and hiring the right people and, you know, making everybody, the team work as a cohesive unit, getting on track with that proper goal. As we kind of wrap up, what, what are some final thoughts that everybody listening today could do in their organization to build, build and then, you know, sustain and grow a really successful high-performance team? You know, I think that in all of this, people ask themselves this question, and they don't even use words. It's kind of an emotional basis. But people say, why am I showing up? And as leaders, we need to be able to answer that. I think that people want to know, how do we get stuff done? You know, if I'm new to a team, how does it work on this team, and how is it different? I think we need to think about that and think about how we can make that easier for people to do. And obviously people want to know, how do we work together, um, and how am I doing? As a leader, we need to look at these questions and be ready to answer them verbally and explicitly and through examples, because these are questions that people are feeling without saying. But here's the thing, and we didn't really get to this, but this is really important, because you're getting to the deep stuff, Ty, about how we work with teams. And that is, people want to know, is this real? In other words, I've been walked into companies where people said, we're high performance and we believe in our people. And then you go find some part of the organization where 
it's obviously the manager's on an ego trip or something. And it's got nothing to do with the team and all to do with making some woman or some man just look good. And the team is feeling oppressed. We can be fooled about a lot of things, but as humans, we're really good at sniffing out if someone means what they say. So when I say you need to trust the team, when I say you need to ask for feedback and actually listen to the answers, I, you can't phone it in. If you want to sustain it, you got to work at truly trusting people. you got to work at asking a question and meaning when you ask. And you've got to work at listening. Those, to me, are the keys to both building and sustaining the team. So listen, this has been great, and I've got a lot of information out of it. Please let everybody know again where they can go to get that, that resource that we talked about. Sure, no problem. So I've got a website, and it's Great Teams Limited. Great Teams, LTD, dot com, and then put your backslash more, M-O-R-E. And I've got a couple PDFs there for people to download that will help them get to know their team better and help them set the meaning for their team, uh, etc. So these are all resources for you and your teams to get a little better. Jeffrey, thanks for coming on with us today, man. This was invigorating. There was a lot of great information. I appreciate you so openly sharing with everybody. Oh, no problem. This was a true pleasure for me, and I loved our conversation. Thanks so much for the insightful questions. So everybody, please go to Great Teams Ltd, which is short for limited dot com forward slash more. That's Great Teams Ltd dot com forward slash more. Grab these resources because, like I said, I mean, when you can start and build a successful team, then really you're unstoppable. I mean, that's how you start multiplying your growth. Is instead of just doing it by yourself, building a really powerful team underneath you. And there's so many resources, even on. On the website great teams ltd let alone with this free access that you have uh, to be able to get down that road get started so another thanks again to jeffrey for joining us today and thanks to all of you for listening in remember this doesn't do anything unless you take action so there's a lot of great tips that are actionable you can take action on immediately and make sure you also take the action of going to great teams ltd.com forward slash more and grab these free resources so you can be an awesome leader you can empower your your team, and uh, most importantly, so you could build a really, really, really successful high-performance team. So make sure you visit greatteamsltd.com forward slash more to get those details. Thanks, everybody. You've been listening to the Business Credit and Financing Show with your host, Ty Crandall. Watch for our next episode to get even more insight on financing and growing your business. And don't forget to check us out online at creditsuite.com for even more business growth strategies.